Ontology, the Waystation of Red-Pilled Sanity Written by William Leo Translated by Deep L. and a Human Read for you by Ginny, Arya and Guy All Bots The Reshaping of the World Order After the First World War Part 4 from the perspective of the Soviet Union, the 1920s and 1930s marked a period of triumphant advancement. The original political situation in China was inherently very fragile. In fact, even after Song Ziwen started to collect tariffs and thus stabilized the Nanjing government, the nationalist government's annual income started at only 80 million pieces of silver before finally increasing to 400 million after a golden decade of great construction. The Beiyang government didn't even have this amount, with merely several tens of millions of pieces of silver, an insignificant sum compared with what their enemies received from the Soviet Union. Between 1927 and 1928, the Soviet Union pumped more funds to support the subversive forces in China than the total income of the Beiyang government and the nationalist government. China at this time was very much like today's Lebanon. Although the Beirut central government that exists in name only can obtain a bit of money from international aid or tariffs, it is actually far less powerful than Hezbollah or the South Lebanese army. Hezbollah, with Iran and Syria's financial aids, has more soldiers in the country than the Lebanese government's army. Its income depends on funding from Iran and Syria, and it is stronger than the Lebanese government. If the Lebanese government provoked Syria or Iran, its own prime minister, such as Prime Minister Hariri, would be assassinated. Under the pressure of Hezbollah, it has to challenge Israel and launch attacks on Israel. Israel's retaliation falls on Lebanon, not Syria or Iran. Although the instigators are Syria and Iran, the war will break out between Israel and Lebanon. Although the Lebanese government does not want to fight at all because of the Iranian forces represented by Hezbollah, it has to fight Israel reluctantly and bear all the losses of the war. The relationship between China, Japan, and the Soviet Union was like this. Although China couldn't beat Japan, just as Lebanon can't beat Israel, and it didn't really want war, but because of the nationalist and communist parties in the country, it had to act as a human shield taken hostage by the nationalist and communist parties. The mastermind to overturn the international order in the Far East was the Soviet Union as part of its world revolution plan, but the Chinese were the ones who shed the blood and lost lives. The Chinese were like the Lebanese today, to act as a human shield for the Soviet Union's world revolution plan. The Chinese, not the Soviets, had to bear the brunt of the Japanese or Western powers' retaliation efforts aimed at restoring the old treaty system. This is the true nature of the National Revolution and later Chiang Kai-shek's regime. In our revolutionary narrative, we call it a great international revolution. In fact, the nature and purpose of this revolution were like Hezbollah's revolutionary actions in Lebanon. At the end of the day, it was a revolution carried out in the interest of a foreign power, with the Chinese as victims. It is as simple as that. In the late 1920s, when Chiang Kai-shek launched the April 12th Party Purge, the headquarters of the Communist International in Shanghai was more like a government than the entire government established by the Nationalist Party in Nanjing. What did the Nanjing government of the Nationalist Party have? It is Tsai Yuanpei, Wu Jiehui, and other veteran committee members, together with a small army piece together by Chiang Kai-shek, funded with several 10 million pieces of silver obtained from the Shanghai capitalists through persuasion or coercion. In Shanghai and Guangzhou, the Communist International transported the money to Guangzhou through Annan, through the United States and Mexico to Shanghai and directly to Feng Yuxiang and Xing Shitsai through Outer Mongolia and Central Asia. All this money flooded into China and established a government in effect albeit without the title of a government but with a wealth that was several times bigger than that of the official nationalist government. Most of the funding did not fall into the hands of the emerging Chinese Communist Party. 
Looking back, those who got the lion's share of the funds were warlords like Feng Yuxiang and Xing Shitsai. They were close to the Soviet Union and may split the northwest part of China into a new republic. They got most of the money. The second largest share of the fund was sent to Shanghai, an international metropolis. Through the Communist International, a large amount of money was transferred from the United States and Mexico to support red terrorists like Zhou Enlai, Gu Shenzhong and Xiang Zhongfa. Sponsored by the Communist Party, they went about blackmailing capitalists and disrupting the economic order of Shanghai. The third route was from France. The Soviet underground organization in France uses cultural activities as a cover. It was actually a subversive force, passing through the French colonies, from France to Indochina, from Indochina to Hong Kong, and then from Hong Kong to Guangdong, supporting Wang Jingwei and his Canton Army, Gui Army as well as the Canton, Hong Kong strike. This was how the funds found their way to China. Through these three routes funds from the Soviet Union continuously poured Soviet funds into China under various names. As long as the flow of these funding channels remained uninterrupted the nationalist government wouldn't possibly be able to function. In fact, it would be impossible for any government, the nationalist government nor others, to govern. The nationalist government in this situation was like a block of ice floating on the surface of a pot of boiling water. The bottom was full of boiling water, heated by the fire fanned underneath by the Soviet Union. The nationalist government and Chiang Kai-shek floated on it like a block of ice. Sooner or later, they would be melted by this pot of boiling water. From the perspective of funding alone, the nationalist government could never have stood on its own feet. Other things aside, we usually believe that intelligence units such as the Central Bureau of Investigation and Statistics and the Military Bureau of Investigation and Statistics were fascist entities established by the Nationalist Party to suppress various revolutionary organizations, including the Communist Party. But a closer look at those who founded them would show you how ridiculous that idea is. Like the U.S. Strategic Intelligence Agency, they were built with the help of Soviet secret agents and the underground units of the Communist Party. When the Nationalist Party leaders first started to set up the two intelligence units, they had neither funds nor manpower. Those recruited would only be paid for any task accomplished and would get no money if not. They often had to have two livelihoods. Many of the most core and most active personnel of these intelligence agencies had two jobs from the beginning. Anyone who watches TV dramas by the Chinese Communist authorities can tell that Li Kenong was the founder of the intelligence agency of the Chinese Communist Party, but he was first a member of the Nationalist Party, and also the founding father of the intelligence agencies of the Nationalist Party. That is, the intelligence arms of both the Communist and the Nationalist Parties were single-handedly built by Li, an underground agent of the Communist Party. This gives you an insight into the true nature of the relations between the two parties. You will no longer be fooled by the propaganda narratives about the strife between the Nationalist and the Communist parties. To put it in plain words, the Nationalist Party and the Communist Party were the current Lebanon and Hezbollah. The former was the nominal governing power, but in reality, a very flimsy white glove whose core intelligence units were set up with the assistance of the latter's underground branches. Until the Nationalist Party's exile to Taiwan, both the Central Bureau of Investigation and Statistics and the Military Bureau of Investigation and Statistics had always been a paradise for the underground members of the Communist Party. Although Dai Li was known as a butcher of the Communists, he never fully eliminated spies in his organization. The Nationalist Party publicly denounced the Communist spies with zeal and fervor, precisely because it was completely hijacked by them. With this, you will be able to understand why during Sino-Japanese diplomacy in the 1930s the Japanese repeatedly emphasized that the Nationalist government must eliminate the internal Bolshevik elements. As long as the Bolshevik elements were not expelled, the Sino-Japanese peace negotiation would not succeed. Whenever a truce was negotiated, 
the Northwest Army or other pro-Soviet forces could always instigate provocative actions like terrorist attacks to breach any agreement reached, which was exactly what happened repeatedly throughout the 1930s. According to the current Chinese school textbooks, Japanese soldiers continued to invade and attempted to annex North China, but that was not true. The Japanese indeed wanted very much to absorb the northeast of China. That was without a doubt. But North China was poor and populous, whose development was impossible, hence a burden for Japan. The purpose of Japan's operations in North China was the same as that of Israel's security penetration in Lebanon, because all the Chinese forces, including the nationalist forces of Chiang Kai-shek and the pro-Soviet forces of the Northwest Army within the Nationalist Party, used Hezbollah tactics to stir up troubles in northeast China and constantly harassed the Japanese occupying forces in that region, just as Hezbollah in Lebanon kept firing missiles at Israel with the Lebanese army. So the only option Israel had was to create an unarmed zone in the border area to block the source of infiltration. This was the fundamental purpose of the Japanese engagement in North China. The so-called Tongu Agreement established such an unarmed buffer zone or security zone. It established In Ruging's anti-communist autonomous government, the same way as Israel established the South Lebanese Army, in order to separate China and Japan so that it could quietly enjoy the booty seized in Manchuria. Yet the Nationalist Party and the Soviet Union just wouldn't let it enjoy quietly and used various irregular measures to harass it. Such harassments repeatedly led to the breakdown of commitments and agreements between China and Japan and ultimately resulted in the fatal July 7 incident and the long-term Sino-Japanese War. The Sino-Japanese War was the greatest victory of the Soviet diplomacy since it finally achieved Stalin's goal of using China as a human shield. Once the Sino-Japanese War was fully launched, it was impossible for Japan to beat the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union would win no matter what the outcome of the war was, if China won, the treaty system would collapse as a whole, thus reaching its ultimate goal of damaging the imperialist Far East system. If China lost, all of Japan's resources would be spent on the suppression and occupation of China, leaving it too exhausted to oppose the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union would at least be safe. This was the outcome of the Nationalist Party's diplomacy. Even if a nationalist like Chiang Kai-shek was not a supporter of the Soviet Union, he was contributing to Soviet diplomacy by implementing Chinese nationalistic policies. Warlords such as Feng Yuxiang and Zhang Fakue directly received funding from the Soviet Union, undermining Chiang Kai-shek's goal of unifying China and establishing pro-Soviet powers as much as possible. Not to mention the Communist Party itself. The whole of China was the white glove of the Soviet Union to various degrees. The Soviet success in China was also the triumph of Leninism. The principle of Leninism is to reverse the order of Marxism. According to the principles of Marxism, where will the revolution be realized? Where capitalism is the best developed, the more mature the capitalism is, the more likely it is to further evolve into socialism. That is to say, in places like Britain and the United States with the most advanced capitalist development, socialism should be built as the next step. Leninism argues for precisely the opposite. It believes that capitalism is the strongest in places where it is most developed. One can't beat it there. One has to attack them in the weak links of capitalism, for example, in places like Tsarist Russia, in order to establish a socialist country. Facts have proved that Marx was wrong in this aspect and Lenin got it right. After the revolution was first realized in Russia, the diplomatic activities carried out by the Soviet Union were actually a series of tentative activities, that is, to test where the weak links were. History proved that Europe was not a weak link. The power of the European capitalist class was very strong where all insurgencies had been suppressed. The finding of the tests was that China, which was too remote for imperialism to cover, was a weak link. China's internal political system was extremely fragile and the warlords were divided. There were always warlords that could be bribed, 
as well as a huge social vacuum for maneuvering. As Mao Zedong said, when it is dark in the East, it is bright in the West. China was divided and highly unevenly developed. There were always areas where you could gain a foothold. Such a country was the ideal choice. And the best part is that China, like Ethiopia, was a nominally independent country. If it were a colony, it would have been a different story. The focus of the Soviet subversion in Africa was Ethiopia. Why? Because most parts of Africa were colonies controlled by Britain and France. Open aggressive subversion in those places would provoke direct counteraction by Britain and France. The Soviet Union might not be a match for them. But Ethiopia was not a colony, making it impossible for the Western powers to intervene in it directly. And this independent country itself was very backward, very chaotic, very corrupt, and its social structure extremely fragile. Ethiopia's own social structure couldn't withstand the subversion of the Soviet Union, and its independence ruled out direct intervention by the British and French imperialists. The same was true about China. Why didn't the Soviet Union succeed in revolutionizing Indonesia, Korea, and India? One important reason was that these places were under colonies of imperialist powers where the imperialistic rule was relatively intact and effective, and subversive activities could be easily suppressed. China was an independent country in name. Even in case of blatant interference and subversive activities like the Guangzhou Uprising, imperialist powers couldn't openly and directly oppose it, and China's own political forces were not capable of counterattacking. Therefore, China served as the best point of entry for the Soviet Union, that is, the weak link in the assessment of Leninism, and an ideal location to carry out the revolution. Thank you for listening. This is a podcast series produced by Luminous Society. Luminous Society provides you with an alternative historical narrative.